Good morning, church. You guys look more awake. You must have had your coffee already, which is good. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Ed, for the introduction. It is so great to be with you today. And it's just awesome to see some familiar faces, you know, so praise God. Um, like Pastor Ed mentioned, you know, we came here, uh, actually the end of 2011, 20, 2012, so it's been over 10 years, but God has been so faithful. But let me share with you how we ended up here. It wasn't that long ago that I was, you know, right after college in the state. Um, I was born here, then I immigrated at a very young age, uh, and I, as, when I finished university, I went into the corporate world, into the marketplace. I was doing okay. Uh, I got married young, uh, and we have a couple of boys. And we were in California as a single parent, uh, I mean, single income family by choice. Think about how difficult that must be in California, right? But we did that, and, and God was faithful. And we were, I was climbing that corporate ladder. I was determined to, you know, make 250 k a year, right? But God had a different plan, you know. Uh, I got plugged in at a wonderful uh, church there, and the next thing you know, we went from being in a, a small group to leading a small group, and, and my wife was with, uh, you know, uh, helping with the ladies' Bible study. I was teaching raw ranger, just like many of you, you know, just lay people at the church, sitting exactly where you guys are in the pew. Then one day God told my wife that we were going to be missionary, and I actually ignored that calling for a whole year because I was making good money. I was uh, getting paid salary plus commission. And uh, I said, no, no, and no, okay? Until at one of the men's uh, retreat up in a mountain, the Lord spoke to me. You see, at this time, my salary was about one-third salary, two-third commission. What the Lord spoke very vividly to me was that, well, you know, you have been, you have been a bad boy, he said. He said, you have not listened, you have been disobedient. So when you go down from the mountain, okay, if you're not going to listen, you're not going to obey, that is fine. You see, in Isaiah, he said his words does not return void, right? But it will accomplish what he set forth. He said, I will ask someone else to do what I've been asking you to do. But you need to start figuring out how to continue to support your family on just your base salary and zero commission. Now, I know we often talk about the fear of the Lord, but as a man who wants to provide, I, I'm telling you, that was, I have never experienced the fear of the Lord like that, Okay. So I went down from that mountain, and I, I remember, you know, I have, we have met uh, Ron Maddox before, who was the missionary director for, you know, uh, Northern Asia at that time. I, I didn't think anything of it, except he was a little short white guy who speaks Cantonese, right, because Ron spent some time here. But at this time, I said, I said, Joy, I said, honey, we need to call Ron Maddox. We need to, we need to be, be obedient to God. <laughs> and, and she looked at me, she goes, you don't, you don't just call the guy who is in charge of of Northern Asia. And I said, honey, I'm in sales, okay? If the boss doesn't want to talk to you, he would delegate you to someone else, okay? So we call uh, the number that we have, and who answered the phone? Ron Maddox. So Ron Maddox said, well, you don't have any Bible background. You were in the, in the marketplace. But we do have a program called Missionary Associate, which you can do. See, you see their, their catchphrase was, uh, catchphrase was give, give us a year, but pray about our lifetime, right? So I was not picky in where I want to serve. I said, well, I mean, I don't want to, I don't speak Mandarin at this time. I said, but I'm fluent in Cantonese. I was born here. I said, so if you can put me anywhere, you know, you put me in southern, China, uh, southern uh, mainland or, or anywhere in, uh, that speak Cantonese, I can be useful. And just the different working of the Lord, I, I, I ended up here at ICA. And, and there was, you know, the beginning of manna. And so at that time, Pastor Kamchi and I, the two of us, just ran a majority of the activity in Manna, and God have uh, so thankful how God used us to minister to the elderly. You know, we led them to the Lord. We we visited some of the subdivided home in Mong Kok and, and also uh, Sai Ying Pun and and you know here in North Point as well. And I did drive. We had a van back then, a man of van, and I drove it everywhere. You know, I, I think I actually had a one fender bender. I think at one time, you know, but <laughs> you know it's. Small spaces, right? But God has been so good, you know. So, uh, and that's that's how we got our started. So, thank you, Pastor Ed, for giving us our first chance at full time ministry. And here we are, ten plus year later. Uh, like you mentioned, we moved to the Philippines just earlier this year to continue to work there. Um, so, if you can see the PowerPoint, I think my family is up there. So, um, you know, just uh, give you an idea who we are and what we do. Um, so, 
And there is. If you remember, those birds were just, you know, this high, and, and now they're all grown. On the right-hand side, you see Tristan is now married. Uh, you know, I'm, I can be a grandpa any time, and uh, I told him I'm not ready yet because I'm not even 48. So I'm way, I'm way too young for that. Uh, and the two younger boys, they are both at university. They're all in the U.S. The only time they call is when tuition is due, um, you know. But that, that's just the life of a parent. And, of course, you see Annabelle is with me this weekend. So we thank God, you know, for, uh, for these wonderful kids. So, okay. Well, do me a big favor. Look at your neighbor with me and say, you look good today. Yep. Yeah. Now, today our message is five big words, okay? It's stemmed from Hosea chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. So we, let's uh, read that together, okay? Awesome. And I will betroth you to me forever, and I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this chance, Lord God, and may you be with us today in the next 30 minutes or so. Just speak to us with your word, Lord God. Even though if they hear my voice, it is your word that comes forth, Lord God, and let us what it is that you desire from us today, Lord, and we give you glory, we give you praise, and we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So before we dive deeper into these two verses, I think it is appropriate to know the background of the book of Hosea, right? Uh, to give us a better understanding of what we'll be talking about today. Now, Hosea is the first book out of 12, what we call the minor prophets in the Bible in the Old Testament. And in the first chapter of Hosea, we see that God has given Hosea an assignment, and not an easy one at that. Right? God told Hosea to marry Gomer, a, uh, a someone who is not faithful. In fact, God told him from the beginning that she was not going to be faithful to him. Right? And we know that throughout history, Israel has been unfaithful to God. Right? So right from the start, we know that uh, this is a book that touches on the unfaithfulness, not just Gomer, but man in general. Right? Uh, and, and, and God's faithfulness to us, towards us. Okay? Just as Hosea is faithful towards his wife. You see, throughout the Old Testament, we see God, uh, you know, answer the prayer of Israel over and over again. Despite all the signs and wonder, they were having such a hard time loving God. And I often, when I read through the Bible, I don't understand, right? How did God rescue Israel? Through the, uh, the parting of the Red Sea, right? And then he led them through a pillar of clouds and pillar of fire, you know, and, I, and as I read through Exodus, I often say, Lord, you know, you know what, Lord, I love you. If you only give me signs and wonder like that, man, I will be so faithful to you. I will never be like those guys, okay? But we know that that is, that is really not how it, it is in reality, is it, right? You know, um, but what I do know, having served the Lord 18 years, I think, you know, what I do know is that it is way easier to serve the Lord when we are in need, when we are in the low places than when it is uh, during the good time, right? So we can take a look at that. We have some example in that. The first one you will see is King David, right? King David, what do we call him? He is a man of the God's own heart. He is so faithful to God, especially when he is on the run, right, from King Saul or when he is on the battlefield. He loved God. But there was a time when he was not on the run. He was not at war. He was on the palace. He was in comfort. And what did he do? He lusted after someone's wife to the point where he plotted to murder her husband just to have her for himself. Good time is, is hard, I tell you. What about King Hezekiah? Right? Once again, here is the king of Israel who was uh, dying. And his prayer, he prayed earnestly to God, said, Lord, can you give me just a little more time? Right? And God faithfully answered him. And he even made time move backward for King Hezekiah. And what did he do? Right? When there was a representative from Babylon come, Hezekiah opened up the vault and showed them all of his wealth. It is difficult to be faithful when things are going well. Are we so different today? 
than those people that we just spoke of? Think about our relationship with God, both at a corporate level and on an individual level. Do we still have our ups and downs with God? It doesn't matter how long you've been working with God. These up and downs still come and go, you know. Perhaps if we are, we've known the Lord for a long time and we are really devoted and we are mature, we, we, we can say that, well, my walk is a little more consistent. It's more stable. But the fact remains that we have moments of despair. I will be the first one to admit that those times do come. Now, we might not have a shrine that is dedicated to idol, but don't, don't think for a second we are any more faithful than those people that are written in the Bible, those who have gone before us. The only difference is that our idols today are different. Moses simply didn't have an iPhone in his hand. Now, with that said, let's take a look at these two verses again, right? Hosea, we knew his vow about to his unfaithful wife. And he spells it out. The Bible spells out how, the, how Hosea would treat Gomer for the rest of her life. And in that vow, he used the title of our message today. The five big words, right? Righteousness, justice, steadfast love, or in some other version, it's an unfailing love, right? Uh, compassion, or in some other places, it's a mercy. And at the end, faithfulness. And we're going to take a look at each and one of these today. Okay? Now, Let's get a count of hand. How many people are righteous? How many righteous people do we have here today? Raise your hand. All right. <laughs> well, it's a question that's been asked over and over again. Now, when I read through the Bible, the first person that I would actually use this word to describe was probably Abraham. Okay. He fit the mold, right? And the, he, there was a time when God was about to destroy a city, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? But Abraham said, no, Lord, Lord, are you going to destroy the good people in there along with the bad too? That's, that's not cool. That's not fair. So he started negotiating with God, you know. And it's, but it's hard. When I read it, really, I was trying to figure out what kind of tone was Abraham having with God, right? You know, he wasn't demanding, hopefully. But Abraham said, Lord, what if I can find like 50 righteous people? Would you leave uh, Sodom and Gomorrah alone? And God said, sure, we can do that. And then that number Abraham was asking for continued to go down. What if we have a 45? 40? At the end, he said, what if I can find 10? And God said, okay, if you find 10, I will leave them alone. And if you have continued to read through Genesis, you realize that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed at the end, which means they were not able to find 10 righteous people, right? Now, as we continue to read through the New Testament, I think the most accurate description of humanity's righteousness is found in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Right? And it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. See, now we know why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, because none of us are righteous. Not one. But fortunately, the God that we serve is righteous. Interestingly, if, you know, if you've been around long enough, you know that only the righteous will get to heaven. So if none of us are righteous, how do we get there? Right? How do we allow people to go into heaven? Well, we get there by our faith through Jesus Christ. Right? And that is why so often one of our, our Christian jargon is we are saved by grace, uh, you know, but justified by faith. Now, another thing about righteousness or being righteous is simply about doing the right thing. For example, another person that we often hear about in the Bible is Moses, right? In chapter 2 in Exodus, we know that Moses, at this time, just about 40 years old, okay? So he had just killed an Egyptian, so he was on the run. And while he was on the run, he saw a group of ladies who were being bullied by this shepherd. Now, what was, what was the lady, these ladies doing? They were simply trying to draw waters for their cattle, okay? And they were being harassed by this group of men. So instead of simply watching, being a bystander, Moses decided to help them, and he drew water for them, okay? And God rewarded him, by the way. He 
out of those ladies that he have, one of them end up being his wife. So single, uh, single men, if you see a lady in help, make sure you help them, okay? You, you never know what you'll get out of that, right? Now, as we look back at the 50 years of ICA and MANA, I can see that God's righteousness coming through because the, the fact is this, okay? As followers of Christ, we have a greater responsibility to those uh, that have not accepted Jesus. So while giving back is good, right, for us is, is a responsibility, is a duty. Voluntarily giving back to society and to help those who are in need is simply the right thing to do. And ICA has, and MANA have done that so well. And we praise God for that. Now back to Hosea, right? Right after righteousness is justice. Now I don't know what, what, what image comes to your mind when, when you hear the word uh, justice. But uh, growing up here in Hong Kong, and until I immigrated, I was, I was 12 years old, okay, um, when I left. I remember watching TV, just like many of you do on TVB or, you know, the, the channel, um, was the courthouse in Hong Kong. Right in front of it was Lady Justice there, blindfolded, uh, one hand with a sword and the other hand with a scale, okay? And which is, is supposed to symbolize integrity and fairness and justice, okay? And you, mean, you might be thinking, what does that mean to have integrity and uh, you know, for me, someone with integrity cannot be bribed, okay? And someone who's consistent. And being fair simply means that when it comes to being punished for, uh, for a deed, when it comes to being disciplined, that those things will be handed out accordingly to the offense itself instead of the status of the person committing the offense, okay? In Proverbs 11, you will see that God talks about how much He hates a dishonest scale. And once again, in the second chapter of James, you see, uh, you know, the, almost half the chapter in, in uh, James chapter 2 is about how we should avoid favoritism in the body of Christ, in the church. So here it is. When it comes down to justice and how we should respond to God's expectation of justice, we need to know no further than in the book of Micah. Okay? Micah chapter 6, verse 8. It said, What does God require of you but to do justice, like I said, meaning having integrity in being fair, and to love kindness, having compassion on people, and to walk humbly with your God? Now, personally, I find that when I am walking with God in humility, having compassion, it's not difficult. It's quite easy. Right? I want you to think about when you go through the four gospel, right? Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How many times did it talk about Jesus having compassion or, in other words, having pity on people, right? It happened very, very often. Now, I can tell you, my family have lived at, uh, from the time we were here over 12 years ago to now, we have lived, at four, uh, lived in four different places, Okay? And we were here, then we were in uh, uh, an unspecified country, then we were back in the U.S., and now we're in the Philippines, okay? I have seen the poor everywhere. Even in the state, believe it or not, in the U.S., they have poor people. But I'm, I'm having now lived in the Philippines, I can tell you the poor people in the U.S. would be very rich in the Philippines. But with that said, everywhere we go, I have seen the poor. But I tell you, when we moved to Manila this past January, I was shocked. It was the, the poverty was so blatantly out there. It became a challenge for me because I can, I can have compassion on people. But when I see it every single day, every two, three hours, I see someone begging on the street while I'm driving. It's hard. It is difficult. I started to pray. And then I started to pray every morning. I find that my prayer life is more important than ever. Every morning when I wake up, I said, Lord, please don't let me be numb to the things I see. I was telling someone earlier today, I said, there was, uh, I was just buying flour for my wife a couple of weeks ago, and 
And this little boy come to me. He didn't speak English. You know, Philippines speak a lot of English, especially in Manila. But this boy didn't speak a word of English. He might be eight or ten years old. He was speaking Tagalog to me, and he did this hand motion. He go. He just wanted something to eat. And I, the Holy Spirit prompted me to give him something to eat. So I went into a restaurant. I bought him some food, and I was on my way out. Then the Holy Spirit prompted me again. Let him know that I love him and that he matters to me. So I went back in, and I mean, I thought, I, t- I can tell him that in English, but he wouldn't understand, right? So I told the cashier who I've just paid, I said, would you please tell this boy that Jesus loves him? And so that this boy was, re- was able to know that it was not I who bought him that meal, but it was Christ who cared about him enough to buy him that meal. I need the Holy Spirit to guide me and lead me more than ever since I've been in Manila and praise God for that. I love how Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, when it comes to compassion, when it comes to mercy. You see, in this part of the chapter 25, Jesus was talking about feeding the hunger, uh, the people hungry and the thirsty. They talk about when we close strangers that we don't know. And also, when we visit the sick or we make a prison uh, visit to the uh, in, for people in prison, Jesus said, "When it comes to doing these good deeds, right?" They say, "And the king will answer them truly." I say to you, and as you did this to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it unto me. What I did with that little boy, it wasn't about him, but about Jesus' love. I did it unto God, unto Jesus. So praise God for that. You will see a couple of pictures here that, uh, from when I was working for Manna about 12 years ago. Now, obviously, compassion was the reason behind everything that we do. The hours that, that Pastor Gumchi and I put in back in those days to all the weekly activity was not just about the items or the activity of the event itself, but it was about Jesus. Okay? As you see, we were you know, pushing that, those items. I, don't, I forgot what was in there. But every rice box we gave away to the elderly here in North Point, it was about Jesus. Right? Every uh, bag of rice or oil we give out to the, the, um, to the subdivided home people in Sayang Poon or Mong Kong, it was about Jesus. Okay? It was always about providing an avenue to them that would lead them to the Lord. Then compassion we show was not just about the tangible Right, things that we can hold on to. But it was about how we can lead them to the knowledge of a Savior who bridged the gap of sin for every single one of us. Finally, I want to finish talking about God's unfailing, steadfast love and faithfulness to us. And to me, they kind of go together. And nothing exemplified the unfailing love of God better than the parable of the prodigal son. Some of us might have a prodigal son. Some of us might be the prodigal son in our own way. The fact is that we are no less, uh, we are no more faithful than Gomer's or the Israelite that was back in the, you know, the time in the Old Testament. But regardless of our betrayal, God loved us nonetheless, just as the Father loved the Son, just as Hosea loved Gomer. You see, when we repent, God comes to us with a rope, with a rope that put on our shoulder, and He set up a feast for us, regardless of what we've done, how unfaithful we've been. You see, our worth has nothing to do with who we are or what we've done. Our worth is in Christ and in Christ alone. And when it comes to faithfulness, I think many times in the New Testament, Jesus was telling the disciple that signs and wonder would be easy and we can accomplish them if we have faith as small as a mustard seed. What that tells us is that we as men, uh, humanity, lack faith. And that is okay, as long as we realize 
as human, we have limitation. And when we have limitation, those are the time when the Holy Spirit kicked in. After all, how do we get to regeneration? How do we repent? How do we get to sanctification? These are all the, word of the, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. And I think in chapter 9, there was a wonderful example of God's faithfulness. You see, in this chapter, in the middle of that chapter, I think there was a father who brought a son who was possessed with a spirit and he was mute to the disciple. Unfortunately, the disciple was not able to cast out the spirit. So they brought him to Jesus. And as the father spoke with Jesus, he was told by Jesus that all things are possible for those that believe. And the father cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. At that moment, the father realized the only way his son was going to be healed was for him to have faith. He would only be healed if he believed. Now, I believe that more than any other time in history, we live in a world that is demanding a response from Christians. And how we are to respond to this world event, uh, or maybe just local event, right? You know, it's really about what God expects of us. You see, Hosea was obedient to what God asked of him, despite giving a very difficult task. Well, I think we have been asked to love the lost soul the way Hosea loved Gomer, the way the father loved his wayward son. And Jesus committed even his own life so that we can opportunity to be reconciled back to the father. We can be righteous by always doing what is right when the opportunity presents itself. We can love justice by treating people fairly, ignoring their wealth and position in society. You see, because those are the things the world cares about, but that is not what God looks at. In fact, I think that was one of the things that the Pharisee hated the most. He didn't care that they were wealthy, and he didn't care about the position that they have. We can continue to have compassion and serve those in need. And you know what? We thank the Lord for the 15 years of man and ministry that will continue to serve the underprivileged in this city. And on a more in, on an individual level, we can be faithful in our relationship with Christ. And I'm not talking about just Sunday. This is, this is wonderful. I, I haven't been in places where corporate worship is not possible. I always cherish this time to worship together. But beyond Sunday, beyond that, I am talking about our own time. What about our prayer closet? What about our small group, right? Those are the times. Are we praying for one another? Last but not least, unfailing love is done by allowing the Holy Spirit to help us put up with one another. You can be the nicest person in the world, I can guarantee you. There is someone out there who thinks you are difficult to deal with. Okay? But the Word of God calls us to put up with one another, forgive one another, and pray for one another. And at the end, we can respond to God by stop simply watching. And start participating. Right? I know many of you are already participating. Right? That's why this is a church that does. This is a church that actually do things and make a difference in the city. And we thank God for that. Okay? You have all heard that agape is a verb. Even though sometimes it is easier to just sit down and remain on the sideline. But the truth is that God is waiting for you to get into the game and be the different maker that you can be. If COVID has taught me anything, it is that Christians need to get out of the buildings, get out of the four walls, and take the Word of God to where people are. Because there will always be people in this world that never set foot into a church building. But together, we can take the gospel to them. I'll leave you with this today. 
That's a word from the St. Francis of Assisi, by the way. It's way easier to pronounce his name in English than in Cantonese. Um, this is what he said. We should preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. We can do that. We can all do that. But it's going to require the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray together and thank the Lord for his unfailing love and his faithfulness towards us. And I believe that the greater work will be done according to his will in his timing in this city through MANA and ICA. Would you stand up as we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessing you have given us over the year. We are grateful for all the lives that have been changed because of ICA. I pray that we will continue to be a vessel for you. And when we act with compassion, people see you. And at the moment and a different time when our flesh fell us, you will be faithful. We can count on the Holy Spirit. For your word said, when we are weak, you are strong. For your power is made perfect in weakness. Holy Spirit, continue to guide us so the world can witness your steadfast and unfailing love. And may we continue to act justly towards one another and serve you with integrity. Last but not least, Lord, it is our prayer that ICA will continue to be a light in this city. And we pray and ask all of these things in your mighty name. Amen. And bless the Lord.